All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hope you all had a good weekend. Uh, as advertised, uh, we are going to do a follow-up to the Zika briefing that uh, we did at the top of a briefing uh, here a couple of months ago. Uh, so I'm joined once again uh, by Dr. Ann Shuket from the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Dr. Tony Fauci from the National Institute of Health. Uh, both of them will be able to provide you an update on some additional information that we have learned about this virus and the risk that it poses to the American public. Uh, they'll also be able to provide us some additional information about the funding request that the administration put forward to the United States Congress uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, as we discussed in the briefing last week, we have not seen the kind of response uh, from Congress that we would expect. Uh, and frankly, we haven't seen the kind of response from Congress that is clearly in the uh, interest of the uh, safety and well-being of the American people. Uh, and so uh, both Dr. Shuket and Dr. Fauci should, should be able to provide you some insight into how those resources will be used. Uh, each of them will make uh, brief opening statements. And then for questions on this topic, uh, we'll do those at the top so that they can answer them, and then we'll let them go, and uh, we can uh, discuss the wide array of other topics that are likely to come up today. Okay? Uh, so, Dr. Shuket, why don't I turn it over to you first? Um, thanks so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Since we last discussed the Zika virus, we continue to be learning pretty much every day, and most of what we're learning is not reassuring. We have learned that the virus is linked to a broader set of complications in pregnancy, not just the microcephaly, but also prematurity, blind uh, eye problems, and some other conditions. We have learned that the mosquito vector, the Aedes aegypti mosquito, is present in a broader range of states in the continental U.S. So instead of about 12 states where the mosquito Aedes aegypti is present, we believe about 30 states have the mosquito present. Um, we've also learned that the virus is likely to be a problem at um, much of the pregnancy period, not just probably the first trimester, but potentially throughout the pregnancy. These, this information is, of course, of concern, and CDC has been working 24-7 to protect pregnant women, to support the state and local health departments that are that front line of defense, to learn as much as we can about the mosquito that can spread the virus and about the virus itself, and to work with other countries to um, learn what we may be seeing later in the, in the continental U.S. We are quite concerned about Puerto Rico, where the virus is spreading throughout the island. Um, we think there could be hundreds of thousands of cases of Zika virus in Puerto Rico and perhaps hundreds of affected babies. We know that the pregnant women in Puerto Rico are very keen to protect themselves and to have community protection, and we're working closely with the authorities in Puerto Rico to support that response with mosquito control beginning and with the distribution of what we call Zika prevention kits for pregnant women. We've learned that mosquito transmission is the usual way that the virus can spread, but it also appears to be spread through sexual transmission. And that has meant we've had to issue updated guidance for couples on how to prevent spread of the virus, particularly pr to pregnant women. The other thing that we've learned is that there's a resounding um, interest in preventing this disease and controlling it as well as we can. Uh, last week, um, there, or on April 1st, the CDC and U.S. government convened a Zika Action Plan Summit in Atlanta. Um, leaders from more than 30 states and territories uh, joined in Atlanta to do Zika action planning to get ready for mosquito season. There's a lot to do to increase laboratory diagnostic testing, to increase mosquito surveillance, to increase human surveillance and birth defect surveillance, and to improve our communication so people have the best information to protect themselves and their families. So that's what's been going on since um, we talked a couple weeks ago, and I'll turn things over to Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Anne. And in a similar vein, since we spoke last at the same week that the CDC had their summit in Atlanta, we had a research meeting on Monday and Tuesday of that same week uh, right in Rockville and North Bethesda. And to underscore what uh, Dr. Shook had said, we're learning more and more about this. And I'm just going to give you a very brief summary about that. The, but the more and more we learn, the more and more you get concerned about the scope of what this virus is doing. Bottom line is we still have a lot to learn. 
The first thing was a, a very important study uh, at the very fine molecular level looking at the virus and seeing if it was any different from dengue, because the question we keep asking, it's a flavivirus, it's transmitted by the same mosquito, what is the difference between Zika and dengue? And it looks really very much the same molecularly, except there's a very short, small run of amino acids, namely the building blocks of protein, at the part of the virus that binds to cells. So it may be that that's the clue of why it acts different, particularly being neurotropic or being having a, a propensity to infect neurological tissues. Good news is that we developed two animal models, two mouse models since we spoke last. And again, the mouse models underscore what Dr. Shook had said, because when you infect the mouse, there's a very strong propensity to infect neurological tissue. We've developed a monkey model, which is interesting because the monkey now, you can get a monkey pregnant and look at the difference between the virus and a pregnant monkey and a monkey who's not pregnant. And what we've seen, and this is just preliminary data, but it's really quite uh, scintillating, is that the virus stays around the blood significantly longer in the pregnant monkey than it does in the non-pregnant monkey. And the reason that's important, you might remember, we had a case here of a Washington resident who was infected during pregnancy, affected the fetus, and that person had weeks of viremia, which is very unusual because viremia only usually lasts a couple of days. Again, the neurological issues are important in vitro studies of getting the virus and putting it in neural stem cells, showing that it has a very strong propensity to destroy tissue, which could explain why, besides interfering with the development of a fetus, it might directly attack brain tissue, even when the fetus is later on in the period of, uh, of gestation. We also are continuing with the vaccine studies that I mentioned to you. I told you that we would very likely have our first vaccine candidate in phase one in September. That looks like it's on time. We're producing it in our pilot plant outside of Bethesda, and we're gonna then be processing it to be able to get it through the FDA to put into a human. And then finally, we have a screening program for drugs that I mentioned to you. We hadn't screened any drugs the last time we spoke. We've now screened about 62 drugs and have 15 of them that have some degree of activity. Caution, that doesn't mean they're going to turn out to be good drugs, but they do have some activity. So in summary, a lot of things have gone on, uh, things that are pointing to serious issues that we need to address but we've learned an awful lot since we spoke next, and we really do need to learn a lot more because this is a very, very unusual virus that we can't even pretend that we know everything about it that we need to know. Thank you. All right, we've got questions on this. Jeff, do you want to start? Yeah, um, thank you. Doctor, you mentioned you expected there to be hundreds of thousands of cases in Puerto Rico. Do you have a prediction or a range of how many you expect uh, in the United States broadly? You know, much of our predictions come from what we saw with dengue virus and chikungunya virus, and those two viruses are also spread by the same mosquito. And in Puerto Rico, they ranged between 25 and 80 percent of the population getting infected with one or the other of those viruses over the course of one or multiple seasons. In the continental U.S., um, those, we have seen travel-associated cases of chikungunya and dengue. We haven't seen large numbers. We haven't seen thousands of cases of locally transmitted disease from the mosquitoes. Um, we've seen dozens of cases, but we absolutely need to be ready. You know, as, as Dr. Fauci was saying, everything we look at with this virus seems to be a bit scarier than we initially thought. And so while we absolutely hope we don't see widespread local transmission in the continental U.S., we need the states to be ready for that. And that was part of what our summit was about, learning all they could about mosquito control. What do we know? What do we not know? What can we do with the tools that we have today? And um, how to get ready for mosquito season. When they have a case of travel associated, how to look around that individual for the mosquitoes nearby. We really want the traveling public when they come back from, you know, um, Caribbean or Latin America um, to use repellent for the couple weeks after they return because if they silently got Zika infection and they get bit by a mosquito in the continental U.S., that mosquito can, can then spread the virus. So I don't expect there to be large outbreaks in the continental U.S. I can't give a number to how many cases, but I can say that we can't assume we're not going to have a big problem. We know with other viruses we've had bigger problems than we expected, so we're taking this very seriously. Do you have numbers for other regions of the world? What we, what we know from the other viruses is that 25 to 80 percent of the population may get the infection. We know, for instance, in Puerto Rico right now they're having dengue virus as well as 
the um, Zika virus at the same time. So that makes it even more difficult to tease out what's causing a person's fever and rash. So I would say that in Latin America, we know they're uh, at risk for very high attack rates of the virus. In terms of pregnant women, we don't know yet when you have Zika virus infection during pregnancy, what percent of the time the baby will be totally normal and what percent of the time there'll be a complication. That's one of the most important questions for us to answer. And teams are working in Colombia, in Brazil, in Panama, trying to answer that question because that's the most important question for pregnant women. Yep. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, two for you. One, can you tell me more about the Zika prevention kits and, and what that uh, entails and and for Dr. Shukit, uh, how concerned should American athletes be that may be traveling to Brazil, um, especially as the Olympics come? Are we working on something specifically for Americans that may have that? And I guess I should ask you also another one, uh, Dr. Fauci, about resources. Are you confident that you have what you need to uh, maintain this belt? Well, I'll answer that question and get the, the prevention kit to Dr. Chuck because that is a CDC thing. Uh, the answer is I don't have what I need right now. What I've done is take money from other areas of non-Zika research to start. We couldn't just stop and wait for the money. We had to go ahead for it. The only trouble is if we don't get the money that the President has asked for, we're not going to be able to take it to the point where we've actually accomplished what we need to do. So the answer is we really don't have what we need, but we're still going full blast by drawing money from other areas. And that's how we started. The money that's being transferred over from Ebola account will help bring us a little bit further, but it's still not what we want. When the President asked for $1.9 billion, we needed $1.9 billion. The Zika prevention kits are being given out to pregnant women in the areas where the virus is already spreading. So in Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, there have been about 5,000 kits distributed so far. They include insect repellent. They include uh, information about how women can protect themselves. They include condoms because we know that the virus can be spread sexually, not just through mosquitoes. They include vouchers for screening materials to help people make sure they, the mosquitoes stay outside the home and not inside the home, and those sorts of things. We actually initially were considering putting in some um, permethrin-treated clothing, um, but then some of our surveillance for mosquito resistance in Puerto Rico revealed that permethrin probably isn't effective, so we didn't end up including that kind of treated clothing. But they're essentially um, uh, materials and information to help women protect themselves. In terms of the athletes, you know, we know the Olympics is just a wonderful event and that athletes have been training for their whole lives to go there. We really want to make sure people know that if they're pregnant, they should defer travel. Uh, we also want people to know that um, travel to the area may, be, um, may lead to silent infections or infections with symptoms, and that following infections, it's very important to take precautions during sex not to spread the virus. So that type of information has been shared with the Olympic Committee, and of course the CDC is working closely with the Olympic Medical Committee about further advice. Uh, Thanks, Josh. Uh, for the doctors, are you concerned that by transferring the money from the already appropriated funds last week that reduces the urgency on Congress to appropriate new funds? Well, it shouldn't because, as I just said, it is not enough for us to get the job done. I mean, it's just a, a, a temporary stopgap. Uh, if you look at what we need to do both at the CDC and at the NIH, we have a lot of work to do, and that may, in some people's minds, kind of lessen the intensity of it, but in our minds it doesn't because we still don't have enough to do what we need to do. I was just going to say that um, we also um, feel a sense of urgency about Ebola and the global health security agenda. You know, Ebola is still circulating in Liberia and Guinea, um, and many of the vulnerable countries in Africa are having outbreaks right now. And so we know that we have to be, as a country, ready to support response to more than one outbreak at a time. We think that's really important. So we're working as quickly and as um, deeply as we can on the Zika response while continuing to support Ebola response and recovery. virus is coming to the United States, they're expecting it um, summer or fall. Is there any sort of mosquito forecast, any way of knowing if it's going to be a worse year than usual for mosquitoes in general? And also, what are you telling travelers, uh, people who are going to some of these countries and returning? Should they be tested and where can that be done? 
The issue of mosquito surveillance and prediction is a really great question, and one of the problems in the past decade or so is that we've really let our mosquito control efforts um, wither away, and so we don't have the great uh, information that we'd like to have or even the ability to do better modeling about where in the country the problems are going to be and when they might occur. So strengthening mosquito surveillance uh, before you have to get human disease is a priority for us. The, um, so that, that is something that we're working on, and I think with more resources we could do a better job. Um, I, forgetting what the second part of the question was. Telling oh, people testing. who are going. Oh, testing people, right. Yeah, we do think that if you come back from an area where Zika is spreading and you're pregnant, we recommend that you be tested whether you were symptomatic or not. We recommend testing in the first trimester and then again in the third trimester. Um, in terms of um, people who don't have symptoms, we don't think they need to be tested, but we think that, who aren't pregnant, but we think that they do need to take uh, precautions with, with sexual contact, particularly um, in terms of sex with a pregnant woman. And so we've put out updated guidance on that. We know a lot of couples were asking, well, I'm not pregnant, but I want to get pregnant, and you know, how long do I have to wait? So we, we put out guidance on that as well, about waiting um, an eight-week period following travel before trying to conceive for women and waiting a longer period for men who have symptoms or um, in terms of the potential that men can have persistent virus in the semen. Susan. Doctor, do you think these uh, Zika prevention kits would be useful in mainland United States? And also, do you have a projection on the spread of the Zika virus in Puerto Rico? And to Dr. Fauci, what happens when the stop gap runs out? Um, yes, we do think the Zika prevention kits may be helpful in some parts of the U.S., and there was a lot of interest in them from the state health departments that attended the summit. One of the issues to consider is um, the living conditions. Do people have screens? Do they have air conditioning? We heard that, you know, in parts of Key West, it's very similar to Puerto Rico. People like the windows open and they like that breeze. And so that idea of protecting yourself from mosquitoes that can live inside the house may be relevant here. Um, and then the second question was about, it was for you. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Right, yeah, we've got um, a team working closely in Puerto Rico trapping mosquitoes and looking at where, um, where the mosquitoes uh, are that are um, potentially um, of concern. They're also testing for resistance. And then the human surveillance. And we are seeing it in multiple parts of the island. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it may be that um, the cases we're seeing reported are um, just a small percentage because we think some people can be asymptomatic, not have symptoms, and the only people that are being tested right now are people who come in with symptoms. So we're seeing it increasing across the island, and we're worried that as it gets even warmer, it's going to be island-wide. You know, to be honest, I can't imagine that we're not going to we're not going to be given the money when we reach the point when every time we come in front of you, we tell you things that are more serious. So, I mean, if we reach the point where the stopgap money runs out, uh, again, hopefully that will never happen, but we'd have to start rating other, other accounts, and very important research on other diseases is going to suffer, and suffer badly. Uh, so I, I just almost can't imagine that that would happen because as we keep talking more, I mean, we just spoke to you about the very interesting issue that we're learning. Uh, again, I'm not an alarmist, and most of you who know me know that I'm not, but the more we learn about the neurological aspects, the more we look around and say, this is very serious. I mean, just in the last couple of weeks, you know, we know not only do you have Guillain-Barre, but you have a case of an acute myelitis, you have a meningoencephalitis, and then you have this new thing that was just recently described. We need to get more of the cases to show that it really is associated called ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which is a multiple sclerosis type of an involvement in the brain. Thankfully, it tends to resolve the way Guillain-Barre resolves. But Again, every time we look, we see more and more. So in the context of your question, I can't imagine as we learn more and more things that are troublesome that all of a sudden we're not going to get the money. We really do have to get it. Well, how did the Dr. Fauci, how did this seem to catch us so by surprise? You know, it, it, it caught us by surprise, not in the sense of we should have known because for essentially since the virus was first recognized in 1947 and the first human cases were 1952, it was a relatively inconsequential virus in the sense of a rather mild illness, virtually no mortality, no hints or signals 
of other things that we're seeing now, for example, the microcephaly, the congenital abnormalities, or Guillain-Barre. And what happened, and we don't have all the answers to this, but when it then had its first outbreak, and the first outbreak was in the Yap Islands, that's when things started to explode. And we still didn't get all the information from them, and only when it hit a vulnerable, big population with a lot of mosquitoes, with people who have never been exposed to this before, did we then start seeing the unfolding of this scenario that every week, every month, tends to surprise us even more. But the initial part of it, there was really no reason to be very suspicious that this would be bad. It was one of those viruses that just gave a mild illness. $1.9 billion that House um, Chairman Hall Rogers said that, that they plan to continue to monitor this and then fund it as needed. Why is that approach not appropriate for this uh, virus? Why do you need that $1.9 upfront as a big bulk of money versus getting it as this progresses and it goes forward? And when is it going to be too late? Is it the first bite of local transmission or is it some other point when we start to see those numbers swell? Yeah, we have to do both. You know, I, th I think, as Dr. Fauci said, we haven't been waiting for the money to act because this is so serious. We've been surging our laboratory testing, for instance. There's a big backlog on that laboratory testing. To really scale up um, takes time. And so um, knowing that resources are coming helps with the scale up. There are a lot of commercial partners that are needed for that scale up. Will they actually help without knowing that resources are coming? The vector control, yeah, we have enough money to start on that, but that's an expective, expensive undertaking, the mosquito control efforts. Um, and as I said, we're learning that not all the chemicals or pesticides that are out there will work. Um, there are multi-year studies that are going to be needed for these babies because we really don't know whether a child that looks healthy at birth will actually not have uh, the effect of the Zika virus. So there's longer-term studies that are going to be needed. So what I would say is that people are acting intensively right now, but that um, we can't, um, if, if additional resources aren't coming, we won't be able to commit to the long-term work that's needed. Then the other thing is the places that the resources were taken from were areas where important work was going on. And I think um, we're quite vulnerable if we're not able to meet the commitments on the global health security or the Ebola response and recovery. Yeah. Dr. Fauci, you yeah. yeah, just ditto what, what Ann said, but also something that I mentioned to this group the last time we were here, that we have a very important partnership with pharmaceutical companies. And if they don't perceive us as a reliable partner, they tend to back off a bit. And that would be the worst thing, because we, we won't be able to develop these countermeasures completely on our own. So we need to partner with them. And they would get mistrustful if they say, OK, trust us, we'll give you the money later. Th that doesn't work in industry. Trust us, we'll give you the money later. Hesitation from industry partners since that money hasn't come through yet? Well, the answer is thankfully not yet, but I have considerable experience, as some of you may have remembered, back in the time when we were building countermeasures for biodefense, when we were trying to get vaccines for anthrax and things like that, we were trying to bring companies in. And unless we really had the money up front that they knew that we were going to be a reliable partner, many of the important companies backed out. I really don't want to see that now when we need a vaccine and other countermeasures so desperately. The other prior question was when will, when will it be too late? You know, we, we held our summit with the health departments on April 1st because we know the mosquito season is coming and we didn't want to wait for money for them to get uh, plans done. But they're going to need to actually develop mosquito control efforts, um, surveillance, and a lot, of, a lot of difficult tasks. So knowing that there is some resources now is helpful. They're, they're frustrated because some of the resources are coming from other programs that they have. Um, you know, the problem here is that the mosquitoes come, people get infected, and then it's, you know, several months before the baby is born. And we're really trying to protect every pregnant woman we can right now. So we have this um, double whammy of you see the febrile illness now, you'll see the, the horrible um, effects on the child many months from now. And we don't want to wait for that. We need to act before then. We have time for a couple more, Lauren. First question, uh, Dr. Fauci, the, you said at the beginning that you were moving money around. Right. right now, right. where is that money coming from? And the second question is, is there abstinence information in the Zika kits? Okay, with regard to the moving money around, when you have a f the fiscal year is going to end at the end of September, and we have money that's planned for other things. That could be malaria, that could be tuberculosis, and we have that money. 
that is going to go into the projects that are going to just continue to progress the way they are. We're taking that money and now spending it on Zika. And if we don't refurbish that money, those programs are going to stop when they reach the point when they run out of money. So that's what I mean. What we're trying to do is keep everything going, but you reach a point when you don't come in and backfill it that things stop. And that's what I was referring to of my concern. What are those programs? Well, there are several. I mean, I, I can tell you what we likely would do. One of them would be malaria. The other one would be universal flu vaccine. The other one would be tuberculosis, things like that. Um, the, the guidance that we've issued for pregnant women and for couples in terms of preventing the sexual spread of Zika virus include both condoms and abstinence. Um, the actual uh, wording in the materials for Puerto Rico I'm not sure of because I know we were doing focus testing for the uh, appropriate way to message. Richard. Uh, Dr. Fauci, can you tell us a little more about, uh, you, you, rightfully you, you insist uh, about uh, women who want to, uh, to become pregnant and pregnancy, but uh, can you just tell us a little more about neurological disorder, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, yeah. and, and how, how dangerous is it for the rest of the population? Okay. And at what point will it be necessary to tell people, uh, try to avoid going south? Okay, so I'll, I'll address the part about the neurological and then I'll have Dr. Shu could talk about what recommendations likely may or may not come out. The issue is we're seeing these case reports of things that we had not seen before with other similar viruses. I mentioned the acute myelitis in a young person, an 81-year-old man who developed meningoencephalitis, and now the two cases of what they're calling ADM. We don't know what the denominator is of that. So what, that's the reason why you do these prospective cohort studies and you do surveillance studies, which the CDC and others are trying to get exactly what is the extent of that. Are these just outlier cases? Or when you look very carefully, are you going to see a lot of them? The concern we're having is that at the same time we're seeing the clinical manifestations in people, everything that we do in an animal model or in an in vitro cell line is bad news. The most recent of one, when they put Zika virus into neural stem cells, they have these things called organoids, which are kind of a pseudo brain formation, get completely destroyed by the Zika virus. And then they have a variety of other things that are related to the neurological system. It appears to be very toxically neurotropic, and that's the thing that's concerning. How that relates to how many of the clinical cases we'll see, we just have to keep our surveillance up. Just in terms of the additional travel guidance, we base our updated guidance on the best information we have. At this point, we have enhanced travel recommendations for pregnant women, saying that they defer travel or consider deferring travel. Um, I can't promise that we would never have broader recommendations, but we'll base it on the best information we have. So far, Guillain-Barre syndrome in the background or the general population is fairly rare. If this is truly causing an increase, it still may be relatively uncommon, and so an individual needs that information, but may, may, it may not lead to us saying don't go. John, I'll give you the last one, then we'll let the uh, doctors go. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Dr. Sugar, uh, you mentioned uh, the spread of the epidemic in Puerto Rico and its seriousness. Now, there have been reports from Haiti that it's growing very seriously. Uh, and that the problem is compounded by a reluctance of people to report and say what problem they have at medical centers. What precisely are you doing with Haiti, given its proximity to the United States? Yes, you know, Haiti is a, a key country for us. We've been working closely with um, authorities in Haiti since before the earthquake and, and following the earthquake on intensive support for the public health system there. We share concern about Haiti. The, the mosquitoes are there, the virus is there, and the population is quite vulnerable. And so we do have a CDC country office in Haiti that's working together with the authorities. It's essentially the same principle as what we're doing in Puerto Rico, that people need to be protected against mosquitoes, particularly pregnant women. And um, of course, um, care is not really going to be as, as strong there. We don't have specific treatment, but you know, if you got Guillain-Barre syndrome in, in Haiti, it would be quite difficult. So we, we share the concern and are working with our CDC counterparts there. All right. Thank you, doctors, for coming. Nice to see you. Thanks, John. Nice job. Thank you. Uh, all right. Hopefully that all that is useful, and I suspect that's probably not the, f the last time that we'll have uh, 
Dr. Shukit and Fauci here to, uh, to talk to us about this important issue, but hopefully it also is, uh, serves as motivation for members of Congress to pay careful attention to this top priority. Uh, so with that, though, Kathleen, we can get back to our regularly scheduled programming here. Okay. Um, I wanted to check on two topics. Okay. Uh, First, we have a story um, out today about an AP FOIA request that was related to the USAID's um, to Twitter operation in Cuba. I don't know if you've seen that story, but um, I've heard about it. Yeah, so uh, AP anticipating that you may ask about it. <laughs> um, so uh, AP got some emails that they requested via FOIA last week, and that was uh, two years after the FOIA um, was filed. And the story quotes a former um, USAID official saying that the organization sort of planned on this delay as a way to manage some of the fallout of other criticisms of the program. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how that kind of two-year delay squares with the administration's claim that it's the most transparent in history, yeah. and if you have any concerns that agencies are sort of intentionally using delays to um, to slow walk requests and that, you know, some requests become basically useless because they, uh, information is returned two years later. Yeah. Well, listen, as we've discussed in a much more high profile setting, uh, the individual agencies are responsible for responding to individual Freedom of Information Act requests that they receive from journalists or members of the public. But the guidelines the administration has uh, put forward uh, make clear that a genuine effort to have a bias toward openness and transparency uh, is the approach that we would expect agencies to, to use when fulfilling these requests. Uh, obviously, they have a wide range of factors to consider when being uh, responsive to Freedom of Information Act requests, but uh, last year I think is a pretty good measure that 91% uh, uh, of the responses that were provided to Freedom of Information Act requests uh, included some or all of the information that was requested. Uh, that's an indication that across the administration, uh, the response that you see is consistent with the approach that uh, the administration as a whole strongly supports. Uh, I, I can't speak to the, uh, to the, uh, the details of this particular case because ultimately it was the responsibility of that agency to comply with that request. I'm not uh, I don't know what uh, merited a, a two-year delay or whether or not a two-year delay actually was merited, uh, but uh, I'd refer to the agency for the answer to that precise question. Okay, and um, separately I wanted to go back to a uh, comment the President made uh, in the Fox News Sunday interview uh, that ran yesterday. He said his worst mistake was probably failing to plan for the day after what I think was the right thing to do in intervening in Libya. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you could kind of expand on that. It was only sort of one sentence, but it seems sort of meaningful. Um, yeah. what, what exactly does he see as his mistake, and who does he blame for it? And yeah. does he, is he saying that he personally should have done more planning, or the U.S. should have done more planning with allies, or what exactly? The, pre the President talked about this issue a little bit more in his most recent address to the United Nations at the General Assembly there. Uh, in that speech, uh, the President noted that our coalition, I'm quoting now, could have and should have done more to fill a vacuum left behind. Obviously the situation in Libya was quite unique. You had uh, the Qaddafi regime uh, massing forces prepared to um, carry out an act of violence against a substantial uh, and defenseless population. And the international community led by the United States responded uh, to prevent uh, a good portion of that violence. And that obviously was a good thing. Lives were saved, many lives were saved. But what is also true and what is unique to Libya is that they had a totalitarian dictator in, uh, in power for 42 years. And the civil society and governing structures of that country uh, atrophied. And it meant that once that uh, dictator had been removed from power, that the regular structures that are typically in place in a country uh, were not there to govern the country or to at least ensure some measure of stability in that country until a government could be rebuilt, until security could be restored. 
So the unique confluence of events, the need for emergent action on the part of the international community, and governing structures that just didn't exist led to a scenario where the right decision was made at the beginning to prevent significant uh, loss of life, at least in that specific instance. Uh, but the rest of the international community did not have time and did not succeed in following through with a plan to compensate for the vacuum that was left behind. Uh, and. I think in some ways you could say that the president has tried to apply this lesson in considering the use of military in other circumstances. That asking the question about what situation will prevail and what sort of commitments from the international community will be required after that military intervention has been ordered by the commander in chief. Uh, and. Uh, that, I think, looking back, uh, at least in the words of the President in his conversation with Mr. Wallace, uh, is something that uh, he regrets that the United States and the, rest of the, and the rest of the members of our coalition didn't do uh, as it pertains to Libya. And, and on that sort of notion then, uh, um, Secretary Carter said that the President is going to be asking for more money to help um, stabilize, rebuild economic aid for Iraq when he goes to um, Gulf Conference next week. I'm wondering, is that part of what he's going to do there? Do you have any details on how much aid and, and is this part of sort of getting a more solid long-term commitment from allies? Well, the President is traveling to, to Saudi Arabia next week where he will be meeting with many of our GCC partners who are making important contributions to our counter-ISIL coalition. The focal point of our strategy all along has been building up the capacity of the government in Iraq and eventually the government in Syria, to unite the country to confront the threat that they face from extremists. And uh, there will be a, a series of discussions about what additional steps our, coalitions, uh, our coalition can take to press the case against ISIL in Iraq and in Syria. And I'm confident that there will be a discussion about what additional commitments uh, our GCC partners in particular uh, can make to that ongoing effort. I don't have any details about that conversation to preview right now, uh, but that's certainly something that we can talk about a little bit more next week. Okay. All right. Jeff. Josh, why is the President meeting with Fed Chair Yellen today? What does he expect to get out of that meeting, and what is the, the reasoning for the timing of it? Uh, Jeff, the, the, uh, the President has met periodically over the last couple of years with um, Fed Chair Janet Yellen. Uh, this is not something that they do regularly. I think the last one-on-one -on -one meeting they had was in late 2014. So it's been a little more than a year since they had a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Uh, Chair Yellen did participate in the meeting that the President convened earlier this year with uh, financial regulators across the government. And obviously the Fed plays an important regulatory role and she participated in the meeting accordingly. Uh, the goal of the conversation, I think, frankly, is just to discuss the uh, current trajectory of the U.S. economy but also the global economy. I'm confident that there will be an additional discussion of some regulatory issues as well. And um, you know, the President has talked quite a bit about how his top domestic priority is expanding economic opportunity for the middle class. And um, obviously pursuing that policy priority uh, involves having a uh, sort of broad understanding of current economic conditions. Obviously, uh, Chair Yellen has spent a lot of time uh, examining those conditions and making her own independent policy decisions. Uh, and so it's an opportunity for them, uh, in some ways, to trade notes uh, on something that they're both looking at quite carefully, uh, even if uh, uh, the Fed Chair will continue to make the kinds of uh, independent decisions uh, that we believe are critical to the successful functioning of our economy. A long process went into the President's decision to appoint uh, Janet Yellen a couple years ago. Is he happy with that choice a couple <coughs> years in? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. I certainly don't want to say something that would uh, uh, implicitly call into question her independence. Uh, but I think the President has been pleased uh, with the way that she has fulfilled what is a critically important job. Um, both as it relates to 
uh, making policy decisions that have a significant impact not just on the U.S. economy but on the global economy, uh, but also making sure that uh, the Fed is following through on the important regulatory responsibilities that they have. Um, so hopefully I didn't uh, leave anybody with the impression that, uh, that there is anything less than the utmost respect for the independent nature of her role and the decisions that she must make. Uh, but I think that um, independently, uh, people across the ideological spectrum, at least when it comes to politics, uh, would acknowledge that uh, uh, she has um, filled this very important role quite well. All right. And separately, um, is the White House concerned about the state of events in Ukraine after the Prime Minister has stepped down on Sunday, concerned about the pace of reform and, and otherwise what's going on there? Yeah. Well, Jeff, the, the administration has been concerned about the situation in Ukraine for quite some time now. Uh, and obviously, uh, Mr. Yatsenyuk has played an important role throughout this process uh, as his country has gone through such significant turmoil. Uh, he's played an important role in trying to help uh, his country weather uh, those challenges. And uh, he obviously has been an important partner with the United States uh, as we have tried to provide support to our uh, friends in Ukraine. This would explain why the Vice President of the United States telephoned Mr. Yatsenyuk yesterday. And uh, we obviously are pleased that he has indicated that he will remain on to ensure a smooth transition to his successor. Uh, implementing key economic reforms in Ukraine is going to be critical to that nation's long-term success. And you know, the economic environment in that country right now is difficult uh, and has certainly not been aided uh, by the actions of the Russians to destabilize that country and to violate their ter territorial integrity. Um, so the people of Ukraine and the nation of Ukraine is enduring uh, quite a lot. Uh, the United States will continue to stand with them and support them as they endure these challenges. Uh, but that also means that the, uh, the government U of Ukraine will need to follow through on the critical uh, economic reforms, some of which you alluded to. And uh, we're hopeful that that the commitment to implementing those reforms will continue uh, in the mind of Mr. Yatsenyuk's successor. Okay. Bill. When did the administration begin its review of the declassification of the so-called 28 pages, the last chapter of the 9-11 report? Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, for the details related to the declassification process, I'd actually refer you to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, his office is responsible for these kinds of declassification exercises. and. Uh, they'll make uh, the necessary decisions about uh, which of the materials and how much of the materials can be declassified. Um, I think uh, the President has made clear that uh, trying to prevent bureaucratic overclassification uh, is something that uh, we've identified as a policy priority. And there are a number of steps that we have taken uh, in recent years to make clear that that is a priority, even in a national security context where uh, uh, classified material, uh, uh, preserving uh, classified material uh, is uh, entirely legitimate. Uh, a couple of examples of that. You know, the first is uh, the administration did support the declassification uh, of the key elements of the Senate's report uh, on the former CIA interrogation program. Uh, this is the what's often referred to as the RDI report. Uh, and there was a vigorous debate both in the intelligence community but also in Congress about whether or not key elements of that report should be declassified, and the administration did support uh, the release of a declassified version of that report. Uh, the other example that I can cite, and this is something that we've been talking about uh, the last few weeks, uh, which is the commitment that the administration has made to making public uh, instances in which non-combatants are killed in counterterrorism operations overseas. Uh, there's some more work to be done on this, but this is something that Lisa Monaco, uh, the President's top counterterrorism advisor, discussed. Uh, in a speech recently, and so we would anticipate that um, that we'll have more news about how that information will be released uh, in the coming weeks. But I think it does reflect the important progress that we've made over the course of the administration. Uh, you'll recall, Bill, that in the early years of this administration that uh, individuals who are standing or on standing uh, wouldn't even acknowledge that uh, those counterterrorism operations were taking place. But now you have a situation where the administration is laying out a key uh, system for not just acknowledging that those, that those uh, operations took place, but also disclosing more detail about uh, 
uh, the consequences of those actions. But that, back to this particular case. Yes. Do you know when the declassification effort began? Because in the NSC statement today, mm -hmm. they say that they hope to have it done by the end of the administration. Mm -hmm. For how long is it supposed to take when you have members of the 9-11 Commission, at least three of them, and two former members of intelligence committees, uh, and according to uh, former Congressman Romer, even the Saudis, saying that it should be declassified. Yeah. Well, Bill, I haven't uh, seen the 28 pages, and I don't know what they contain. Uh, so it, I'm just not in a position to explain uh, what the factors are in their uh, ongoing review. I don't know when that process began. Uh, uh, and, and, and it, take till the end of the administration, but may, uh, Again, it, it may, uh, but w without having seen those materials, it's hard for me to explain uh, whether it will or why it would uh, if it does come to that. Uh, I mean, because you did mention the 9-11 the Commission, there is an, an independent investigation that was conducted into 9-11. Uh, this was, uh, you know, you had experts uh, who had previously served in government uh, who led this uh, uh, led this effort, and they did release a report that was declassified. So we do have, the, when I say we, I mean the public, does have a lot of insight into um, what led to the attacks of 9-11 and uh, what steps were taken to try to counter, uh, prevent it from something like that chapter, happening again. The last chapter of that report yeah. was never released. Well, and this is, the, this is a separate report. This is the report that was put together by Congress. And yes, that, that report has not been released, but it uh, is currently being reviewed by the uh, uh, office of the Director of National Intelligence for potential release, uh, but I just don't have an update on uh, their ongoing efforts. The president so. supports the release of this? Uh, I don't know that the President has, uh, has reviewed uh, those 20 pa 28 pages. Uh, I can tell you uh, that um, the President certainly does support uh, being as transparent as possible, but he also believes that, uh, uh, that, our, that these national security officials have an important job to do uh, to make sure that uh, uh, if secrets need to be kept, that they can be. Um, uh, so I, I don't know that the President has voiced an opinion uh, in this particular case, but uh, we can check on that. If all of these people who have read the report, uh, or many of them, suggest that it should be released, then what's the hang-up? I mean, these are people who've seen the classified information. They know what's in it. Yeah. And according to Romer, even the Saudi government supports it. So why the hang-up? Yeah. Well, Bill, I, I think that we have seen, uh, there have been some high-profile examples in the news recently of how well-intentioned, patriotic national security professionals can arrive at different conclusions about what information can be made public without damaging our national security uh, and what information must be withheld. And this is always part of a uh, vigorous bureaucratic debate. And I know that bureaucratic often has a negative connotation. I don't necessarily mean it that way. I just mean that there are well-intentioned individuals with different points of view who can arrive at different conclusions or at least engage in a debate that leaves them on different sides uh, of that debate about what information can be made public w without risking uh, U.S. national security. And um, I, I can't speak to the nature of uh, the debate in this instance because I haven't read the 28 pages, but uh, the President is certainly hopeful uh, that uh, that this is something that, uh, that they can um, resolve uh, consistent with a uh, widely shared view about the need to be transparent, but also the need to protect uh, secrets that are critical to our national security. Okay. Pam. Um, the, the review has been going on, I believe, since 2014. So why does it take two years to review 28 pages? Yeah. Uh, again, Pam, I, I'm just, I haven't read the pages, so I don't know what's in it. Uh, but you can try to check with the Office of, Director of, uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, who uh, will oversee that process, is overseeing that process, and may be able to provide you some greater insight into um, what kinds of factors are affecting uh, the ultimate decision here. Is the President bound by the outcome of that review? Could he decide on his own to say, I'm going to release it anyway, despite what you're recommending? Well, I, uh, I don't know the answer to that. I know that people often discuss the fact that the President does have the ability to um, uh, decide on his own uh, what information can be declassified. Uh, but obviously there is a place, a process in place to consider the various points of view about releasing 
uh, sensitive national security information. In some cases, there's a conclusion reached that this information can be released without damaging national security. Uh, in other situations, the conclusion is reached that the information can't be released because, for example, it could um, uh, uh, reveal uh, sources and methods through which information is obtained. Uh, so the need to protect those sources and methods is often a justification for not uh, releasing information. But again, I don't know whether, that, whether or not that's relevant in the context of this specific decision because I haven't reviewed the 28 pages. If the information included um, evidence or uh, indications that the Saudi government or other institutions in Saudi Arabia had some sort of support for the hijackers, would, would the President feel that he could release that? I think that's a, a hypothetical that's hard to, uh, to address from here. I just don't know whether or not that applies in this case. Okay. Um, on the issue of um, the Wall Street reform, the President said when he had Janet Yellen here in early March that the Wall Street reform has worked. Um, today there was um, another settlement for, you know, as a result of the financial meltdown. Why has there been no major criminal actions? for people who were involved in that. The savings and loan crisis, that, which was a smaller financial crisis, there were something like a thousand major criminal referrals out of that. Yeah. Well, let me start by saying that uh, any sort of decisions about a prosecution for financial crime would be made by an independent federal prosecutor. Uh, so uh, that is, uh, those kinds of decisions are made by prosecutors. Uh, the reason that those decisions are not made, not made by people who uh, are in political jobs is because we have an expectation in this country that the law is going to be applied fairly and evenly without regard to political considerations. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, those kinds of decisions are made by federal prosecutors, and I'd refer you to the Department of Justice uh, to, uh, for an answer uh, or an update. and. Uh, to the extent that they can provide one about an ongoing investigation. Uh, what I will say is that people who have taken a close look at the uh, financial crisis that this country endured in 2007 and 2008, many of them concluded that the problem was not predominantly that individuals were engaged in legal activity, but rather that the risky bets that they were ma making were entirely legal. And that was obviously a problem, because when those risky bets went bad, it shook the global financial markets. Uh, it weakened confidence uh, in the U.S. economy. And it reverberated uh, around the world. That's a problem, obviously. And that is why the President, working closely with members of Congress, was committed to reforming Wall Street uh, in a way that would not leave taxpayers on the hook for bailing out a bank or another financial institution that made bad bets. Uh, the, the reform legislation also included uh, uh, measures that uh, uh, prevented or at least reduced the uh, riskiness of the bets these financial institutions were allowed to make. For example, one of the chief <coughs> reforms that were, uh, that were considered by the law and were implemented successfully is increasing the capital buffer that many banks have to maintain. Essentially, they, can't, they, need to they need to keep in hand more financial reserves to leverage against bets that could go bad. Uh, and that has brought greater stability to our financial system. And the irony of this is, is that we saw many of the leading advocates of uh, banks and traders and people on Wall Street said that those kinds of reforms would throw a wet blanket over the economy, that they would inhibit innovation uh, and inhibit the kind of uh, investment that's critical to the dynamism of our economy. But I think that the, the kind of strength and sustained strength that we've seen in our economy over the last several years indicates that they were wrong, that it is possible to implement the kind of Wall Street reform that would protect taxpayers, that would protect the global economy, without uh, overly inhibiting the ability of the U.S. economy to continue to thrive. And the President's been very satisfied that not only uh, is it possible to strike that right balance, 
but that this reform, that these reforms succeeded in striking that right balance in terms of protecting the American people, protecting the U.S. economy, while allowing our economy overall uh, to uh, to thrive and to become the envy of the world. Well, those reforms are protecting things going forward. Do you think that the fact that there have been no or very few criminal prosecutions of, or of any major players in the meltdown uh, is a factor in the simmering anger that a lot of Americans have that nobody was really punished for what happened? Well, uh, I don't have them in front of me, but there are certainly some statistics that we can provide uh, related to uh, settlements that were obtained by the Department of Justice uh, and other actions that were taken by the Department of Treasury that indicate that there was important accountability brought to bear. And um, that is important. And uh, you know, the President has spoken to how important that is. What's also important, though, and what is also critical to building confidence in the financial system uh, is demonstrating that laws can be put in place to prevent those kinds of things from happening again. And uh, we've been very gratified uh, over the last several years to see Wall Street reform be implemented over the strenuous objections of many uh, on Wall Street uh, in a way that has succeeded in making our financial system safer and more stable uh, without inhibiting the growth of uh, uh, the of a thriving U.S. economy. Okay. Uh, Cheryl. Uh, thanks, Josh. Do you have any update on when the TPP trade agreement is going to be submitted to Congress, or has the Supreme Court nomination thrown off your schedule? Uh, I, I don't have an update for when uh, this would be provided or submitted to Congress. Um, obviously, the text of the agreement uh, has been public for uh, quite some time, and it continues to be available for uh, public review and for review by individual members of Congress. But for an official submission to Congress, I just don't have a time frame to lay out for you. Uh, at, at this point, it's not clear to me that that would have, that that would in any way be affected by uh, the ongoing effort to get uh, members of the United States Senate to do their jobs uh, and actually give Chief Judge Garland uh, the kind of uh, fair public hearing and timely yes or no vote that he surely deserves. Okay. Jordan. In trading notes with the, the Fed chairwoman, uh, will the president discuss the level of interest rates right now? Uh, I would not anticipate that even in a confidential setting that the president would uh, have a conversation with the chair of the Fed uh, that would undermine uh, her ability to make these kinds of critical monetary policy decisions uh, independently. Um, so. You know, the, the conversation hasn't occurred yet, uh, so I don't want to prejudge too much. But I know that the President cares um, deeply about preserving uh, both the appearance of and the fact of the independence uh, of the Federal Reserve uh, and the Chair. Uh, and I'm sure the President will keep uh, that priority in mind, even in the context of their private discussion. Okay. Julie. of classified information. So he said, he, he seemed to make a distinction when he was talking about Hillary Clinton's emails about between classified information and really classified information, as if there were some sort of gray area between whether something deserved to be kept secret for national security reasons or not. But this administration has been pretty absolute about, you know, going after leakers of classified information, of whatever it might be, you know, going as far as as to prosecute them for, for divulging some of this stuff. So I guess I'm wondering which which is it? Like, it does, does the President actually believe that there is some classified information that is more deserving of protection for national security purposes than others? Or does he believe that in all cases you have to follow the law and classify as classified? Well, um, that's an interesting question. Let me try to uh, answer it in a couple of different ways here. Uh, I think what is true is that there are always going to be, always have been, and will be in the future, there will be disputes in the national security bureaucracy, again, I use that word not pejoratively, about what information can safely be released and what information can't. So why don't I just give uh, one general example that I think has been discussed in this context. And when I say discussed in this context, I mean reported by all of you publicly. 
which is the question about whether or not information continues to be classified even though it's been publicly reported. There are some in the national security establishment who would say, well, it doesn't matter if it's been reported by the Washington Post. This information is still classified because it could, if confirmed by the U.S. government, uh, undermine our ability to protect sources and methods. I think other people, probably many other people, would conclude that there's not a significant interest that the U.S. government has in keeping something secret if everybody can read about it in the Washington Post, just to cite one example. And this is, part of a, this is part of a debate that goes on, not just in the context of Secretary Clinton's emails, but in the context of making decisions about releasing uh, information that's requested as a result of a Freedom of Information Act request. And considering the administration responded to more than 700,000 Freedom of Information Act requests just last year, I think that should be an indication to all of us that this is a conversation that happens quite frequently. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, and this is something that the President did allude to in his answer, there are secrets that are critical to our national security. There are secrets that I think that even journalists occasionally would acknowledge should be kept secret in order to protect the American people. Now, how to keep that secret and for how long to keep that information secret is surely the subject of legitimate debate. But at its core, there are same, some things that I think we all acknowledge should be kept secret. And that means when information like that is not kept secret by people who have taken an oath to protect it, that those individuals should be held accountable. Now, when it comes to prosecutions, by the Department of Justice of people who are accused of leaking classified information, violating the pledge that they signed to protect that information. Those are decisions that are made by independent prosecutors. And so I can't weigh in at, on, at this point about whether or not those prosecutions were justified or whether or not they were legitimate or even handled uh, appropriately. Uh, many of the investigations that you refer to uh, were actually begun by the previous administration. And I think that should be an indication to you of how serious this administration takes the responsibility of ensuring that those kinds of investigations are insulated from political influence. The fact that they were, that they were commenced under a previous administration, I think, is an indication that they aren't subjected to second guessing uh, by people who have politics in their job description. That's a good thing for our country. That's a good thing for inspiring confidence in uh, the ability of our investigators and prosecutors to make decisions on the merits, to make decisions in pursuit of justice and not in pursuit of a political agenda. And I think that's why you saw the President draw such a hard line with uh, Chris Wallace in the interview in indicating that he could guarantee that there will not be any political influence in the ongoing investigation of Secretary Clinton's email system. Uh, and that's an important part of preserving the integrity of the justice system and protecting the generally accepted notion of what justice actually is. That this is a decision that should be made by federal prosecutors with regard to the law, not with regard to politics. And the President believes uh, in that principle quite strongly, and I think that's uh, why he was so categorical in discussing it with Mr. Wallace. So the two things, are you, you seem to be suggesting that the President this administration is not supportive of some of these leaked prosecutions that have happened since he's been president. That I, I think the case, I think the point that I'm making is it doesn't matter whether or not we support them. They're going to move forward because the decisions that are made about those investigations are made independent of the preference of anyone with politics in their job description. And that's how it, that's how it should be. So whether or not the um, the president uh, or some other elected official uh, approves of or disapproves of those investigations is irrelevant. These are decisions that are made by independent federal prosecutors, and that's the way in this country that we ensure that our system of justice is conducted uh, with regard to the law and to evidence 
and facts, not politics. So just back to the, the key question of whether, I mean, he, he, he seemed to be saying that there can be a debate over what's classified and what's not classified. You said that earlier. But if that's the case, then how, how, does, how can this administration expect compliance with the law? I mean, is something classified if it's marked classified? If, is it classified if the president or somebody else decides that it is really vital to national security? I mean, it seems like there's a distinction there that's not being captured by the classification process that he's trying to get at that it's not clear under the law. Well, I think the, the president is just making the observation, and I think uh, you're drawing a pretty clear illustration here, too, of how complicated this picture is. Uh, and obviously there is a need for individuals who sign an oath to protect classified information to protect that information. I, I, I sign that oath. That's something that I abide by, even in the context of these kinds of discussions that we have. It's not uncommon for me to be asked about classified information, and I certainly do my best to try to help all of you uh, work on your stories, but I also do so uh, with the knowledge that uh, I need to protect that information. And uh, I'm certainly not the only official in the, in the government that has that kind of responsibility. And it certainly is a responsibility that uh, I take seriously. And I think it's a responsibility that uh, the vast majority of government officials uh, take quite seriously. And I think, as the President alluded, uh, Secretary Clinton has acknowledged uh, that with regard to this information, none of which was stamped classified, that she was a little careless. And that if she had an opportunity to do it differently and to handle this information differently, she would have done that. But what's also true is she has said from the beginning that none of the information that she received or sent from that email account uh, was stamped or marked classified. And I haven't read all the emails that have been released. Many of you have. Uh, but I haven't uh, seen any evidence publicly uh, that what she said about that uh, was wrong. And uh, you know, considering that um, you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of emails, I think that's a, a relevant fact. Okay. Suzanne. Can I, can I just follow up on that? So the president also said he doesn't believe that Hillary Clinton put the na national security at risk. So is just, just to be clear, is this a belief or is this knowledge based on, on, on knowing the emails or being briefed that these emails did not put national security at risk? Well, let me be clear about this, Suzanne. The, the president has neither sought nor received uh, a confidential briefing or confidential information about the ongoing investigation. Uh, the President's knowledge about this situation is based entirely on public reporting. This is the, one of the benefits of the approach that Secretary Clinton and her team have taken to dealing with this matter. Secretary Clinton said, well, let's just make all the email public. And all of you and your news organizations have spent God knows how many hours uh, reviewing all those emails some of them interesting, most of them mundane, but it does give the American public some insight into what is included in those emails. Uh, and the, when you hear the, the President's public comments on this matter, it's based entirely on the reporting that, that you, and you, you, you and your news organizations uh, have done on this matter. So he's confident that there's nothing that is missing in any of the report? I mean, he's absolutely confident that he has all the information he needs to come up with that conclusion. Well, I think the President was asked a specific question, and he shared his view based on public reporting on this that has been done. At the same time, the President was careful, both at the beginning and at the end of the questioning, to acknowledge, and this sort of goes back to what Julie was asking, to acknowledge that the opinion that really matters here is the opinion of the independent investigators who are taking a close look at this. Uh, and the President does have confidence that uh, those prosecutors uh, and other investigators will exercise their independent judgment, that they'll set politics aside and they'll focus on the facts of the case, and uh, they will allow the facts to uh, guide them as they pursue their investigation. And that is, uh, that is certainly what the President would expect, uh, and it's consistent with um, what both Attorney General Lynch and Director Comey have said about their investigations. Point and what the president talked about uh, with Fox, he said uh, regarding the worst mistake, probably failing to plan the day after the U.S.-led uh, invasion of Libya. Um, there are a lot of people who criticize President Bush and his administration for their lack of planning after uh, intervening in Iraq and not having sufficient 
understanding, historical understanding of the sectarian violence there uh, between uh, Sunni and Shia. Does the administration, does the president, do they see any parallels? Do they see any kind of inherent risk in the administration uh, leading a coalition in the Middle East in, in a, a volatile situation such as that in, in terms of his own thinking of lessons learned? Well, I think it's difficult to compare the two situations because um, obviously the previous administration um, ordered a military action uh, as a result of uh, intelligence that didn't prove to be true. Uh, the intervention in Libya was different. Uh, the intervention in Libya was based on an emergent situation where you had a bloodthirsty dictator vowing to slaughter thousands, if not tens of thousands, of innocent people. And the President of the United States led an international coalition to try to prevent that from happening, and by and large, they did. So I think it's difficult to, to compare these two situations. In terms of post-planning, not understanding, or not having the uh, commitment of allies come through, is there any kind of parallel that the administration sees in the risk, the inherent risk of working and depending on those allies and having it fall through? Because you talked about the power vacuum, and that's the same thing we see in the Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I do think that the, the point that the President was making is not that our, uh, that any specific ally of the United States had utterly failed to follow through on a specific commitment that they had made, but rather that the United States and our broader coalition had not succeeded in mobilizing the necessary resources to bring about the scenario that we would have eventually liked uh, to see. Now, the good news in Libya is that we have made some important progress in recent years. It's just taken a whole lot longer than, um, than we'd planned for. And I think that's the point that the President has made. Uh, obviously, the United Nations has done uh, some really important work uh, in building up this uh, a government of national accord that is now in Tripoli and, uh, and working to uh, establish itself as the uh, legitimate government of Libya and to persuade the militias on uh, the varying militias that uh, exercise significant influence over that country to lay down their arms and to support uh, the government of the country that can uh, eventually try to bring the security situation inside of Libya under control. Uh, that this is going to be a, a long process, but the United States, certainly our coalition partners at that time, uh, and the broader international community uh, have been critical to the success uh, of this effort, or at least the progress that they've been able to make thus far. Okay. Uh, Serena. Um, thanks, Josh. So Lieutenant Commander Edward Lynn, uh, charged with uh, espionage and attempted espionage, given the fact that he was a high-ranking naval officer assigned to the Maritime Reconnaissance Unit and the type of information he would have access to. Has the President been kept updated on this case? Has he expressed any sentiments regarding it? And how damaging the information he had access to in the hands of the Chinese and Taiwanese uh, is that for American national security? Uh, I can't speak to the substance of the allegations uh, against the naval officer that you've just described. Uh, the Department of the Navy may be able to provide you some guidance around that. Uh, as it relates to, the, to this investigation and potential prosecution, uh, I am quite limited in what I can say because the Department of Navy has indicated that uh, this individual has been charged with uh, violations, uh, including espionage, uh, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, and uh, there is a risk uh, that, uh, that saying much of anything about it could uh, be perceived as um, the Commander-in-Chief influencing the uh, chain of command with this matter. So uh, there's very little that, uh, that I can say. Uh, I can just con confirm for you that, this, uh, um, that these charges have been filed, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that there is an officer that is uh, uh, in custody at the uh, Naval Consolidated Brig in Chesapeake. Um, but other than that, I'd just refer you to the Department of Navy for the Department of the Navy for additional steps that, uh, that will be taken. Can you confirm that the President is being updated about the case or, in, or expressed any kind of interest at all in uh, I, I actually do not know whether or not the President has been briefed in this particular matter, but we'll see if we can get you some information about that. Okay. And okay. on um, North Carolina, the controversial um, law making it illegal for a transgender person to use the bathroom of their choice, um, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo banned non-essential travel to the state, uh, the boss canceling his show there. 
As the president, um, would he consider not traveling to North Carolina as a result of this law or its impact on federal employees traveling to the state? Uh, I'm not aware of any decision like that having been reached on, on the part of the president or uh, any other uh, federal government official. Um, you know, but uh, obviously we've seen uh, you know, some of the uh, other leaders in entertainment uh, and in business uh, come forward and express their significant discomfort uh, with this law that uh, the state of North Carolina has passed and the governor has signed into law. Um, you know, I think, again, I, I've talked about this a little bit before, but I think it's relevant, particularly in this case, in light of even some of the more recent developments, that the state of North Carolina, uh, over the last couple of decades, has really thrived economically by aggressively marketing a friendly business climate. Uh, they've talked about uh, how they've really been able to harness the innovation in the research triangle uh, to create an environment where small businesses with a good idea can succeed. Uh, and we've seen big businesses uh, look to try to get in on the action uh, and to try to capitalize on that kind of environment to ensure the success uh, of their business or to even advance uh, their business model. I think what is also true, though, is you're detracting from the business environment uh, if you essentially are going to make it legal to discriminate against that business's employees or customers. Uh, and I think that is a, uh, a question that the governor of North Carolina in particular failed to account for, uh, but one that ultimately uh, he'll have to answer for. Okay. Uh, Dave. Thanks, Josh. When you said earlier that the president uh, was taking the lesson of Libya and trying to apply it in other situations since then, were you referring to Syria or ISIL? What were you talking about? Well, I think, this is the, I think this is the kind of lesson that can be applied in a variety of, of situations. I think there's some relevance, relevant lessons to draw in thinking about the situation in Syria. For example, uh, the president has received uh, sustained criticism uh, from predominantly from Republicans, but not just from Republicans, uh, for not ordering a military strike against the Assad regime back in 2013 once the intelligence community had concluded that the Assad regime had used chemical weapons uh, against innocent civilians. I don't know if the President had the situation in Libya in mind as he considered uh, what should happen next, but there is a uh, relevant analogy to be drawn in asking the question about what would happen next in Syria after that military strike was taken. And I, I think that's the understanding the longer-term consequences of military action is important for the Commander-in-Chief to consider. And frankly, it's the kind of thing that the Commander-in-Chief should consider before ordering military action. Uh, and it certainly guides the decision-making that President Obama has made uh, in the context of responding to uh, ISIL, both in Iraq and in Syria. Is it accurate then to say that he, Libya made him more reluctant to go into Syria? Or he, he wasn't predisposed to go into Syria uh, in the first place, was he? Well, I, I don't know about, um, well, I, I, I guess I don't know entirely what you mean by predisposed to go into Syria. I mean, I think you started from a position of not wanting to go into Syria and, and get involved in their civil war, right? That's uh, that, I, that is certainly true, that the, that the President would have preferred to not be in a situation where um, he had to order a small number of uh, uh, U.S. special operators uh, on the ground in Syria. That's true. Uh, but, you know, look, that's also true that he um, you know, would have preferred to not be in a situation in which the United States was carrying out uh, airstrikes or uh, providing assistance to fighters on the ground inside of Syria. But because of the uh, failure of the Assad regime to effectively govern that country, uh, it created a, a vacuum, and we saw an extremist organization like ISIL uh, attempt to set up a safe haven inside of Syria, and uh, that led to some significant problems. And um, you know, the President, at every turn, has been focused on making sure that the kinds of decisions that he's making to counter ISIL uh, are consistent with our long-term national security interests. Uh, and, but I guess the premise of your question that I would disagree with is uh, the President hasn't done so reluctantly. The President has understood 
that at least in this case, it was important for him to order military action in order to protect the American people, in order to protect our interests around the world. Of course, he would have welcomed a scenario in which that uh, use of military force was not necessary. Uh, he would certainly have preferred an Assad regime that was much more effective in respecting and protecting basic human rights and effectively governing that country. That's not what we've seen. Uh, and the President has not hesitated to use military force where necessary to take ISIL fighters off the field, to, con uh, to uh, uh, try to have an influence over the battlefield uh, against ISIL so that we can degrade and ultimately destroy that terrorist organization. Quickly, one other thing. Does the White House have any comment on the $5 billion settlement payment by Goldman Sachs that was finalized today in the mortgage crisis? Uh, I don't think I have a specific reaction to it. I mean, I think it's uh, this obviously goes back to Pam's question from earlier. Uh, obviously, uh, decisions about prosecutions and settlements uh, are made by uh, prosecutors of the Department of Justice, and so I wouldn't uh, second guess uh, their uh, uh, the conclusions that they have reached. Uh, but I think uh, obviously the president believes that um, people should help be, be held accountable for their actions, uh, and that's particularly true if there's a situation in which your actions uh, may have uh, been a contributor to the worst economic downturn since uh, the Great Depression. Okay. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. Uh, interesting conversation between the President and my colleague Chris Wallace on Sunday. The President used the word careless to describe uh, Secretary Clinton's use of her private email server, and I'm wondering if he feels like there is a difference as a constitutional lawyer. Uh, as a scholar, as a president, between the words careless and negligent. Are they not the same under the law? Well, I, I think it's hard for me to parse the, the president's answer on this. Um, I, I do think the president uh, was not careless uh, in choosing which words to use in answering this question. Uh, but, you know, why he chose one word over another is, is not something I don't think it, uh, is not something I can speak to. Do you see them as the same? Well, I guess the point here is uh, that um, in some ways it doesn't matter what I think. Um, in the most important way, it doesn't matter what I think, uh, because this is something that is being looked at by federal prosecutors. And um, they'll take a look at um, how uh, the, the decisions were made about setting up the, the email system. and. You know, they'll ultimately make their own conclusions and they'll make their own determination about what are the appropriate questions to ask. Uh, and again, that is the way that we uh, instill confidence in the public in our criminal justice system, that the questions that are being asked by uh, independent federal prosecutors uh, are questions that they themselves decide to ask. They'll decide who should answer them uh, and they will reach a conclusion about what consequences that means for the law uh, and whether or not a prosecution should move forward. Uh, that's uh, that's the, uh, a process that has served the American people quite well. This is not the tradition in many countries. There, uh, in, in other countries, there are situations where uh, political officials are, essen are essentially in charge of the justice system uh, or uh, wield inordinate influence over the justice system such that people with different political views are treated differently uh, in the criminal justice system. And we value the, the political independence of our justice system in this country because it gives us all confidence that people are going to be considered uh, fairly uh, under the law without regard to their political views. And uh, this is a, uh, a principle that uh, is, uh, is worth protecting. Uh, and sometimes it does uh, mean that, uh, that I, for example, will not be able to answer your questions as, in as detailed a fashion as I would like because it's not just that this is a principle that we want to protect. I think all of you, um, uh, for example, take the Attorney General at her word when she testifies before Congress that she's, quote, uh, um, aware of no efforts to undermine our review or investigation into this matter at all. Um, or when Director Comey says that um, he's taken a close look at the case and, and, and being regularly updated on it because uh, he wants to make sure that, quote, uh, there's no outside influence. Um, so they've been able to, the individuals who are responsible for conducting this investigation, have been able to publicly conclude 
that they don't feel like they're subject to influence. You've heard the President of the United States say definitively in the context of his interview that he would guarantee that there is no political influence that was going to be brought to bear uh, in this kind of situation. And I think the combination of those three comments, I think, can give people a lot of confidence uh, that everybody who goes through the criminal justice system, whether they're as well known as Secretary Clinton uh, or not, uh, is going to be treated fairly uh, and that the public interest will be served by the fair treatment of those individuals. Just a couple more, very quickly. If the President emailed the Secretary on her private server or her Clinton email dot com address, would he not then have an obligation to at least somehow report that because you're talking about government business going to a private email, un presumably unsecure email server. Would he not have to at least report that? Uh, well, Kevin, the, the point here is that uh, while the President was certainly aware of her email address, mm -hmm. uh, he was not aware of the system that had been put in place to support it. Uh, there's, uh, I, there are many reasons why an individual might have, an, uh, particularly in somebody uh, who's in a position like the Secretary of State, who might have an email address that cannot be easily guessed uh, by the general public uh, or by uh, our nation's adversaries. Now, for example, there's a reason that she was not at hclinton at state.gov. State um, and so I think that is the reason that no one who emailed uh, with the Secretary of State, at least that I'm aware from the White House, um, knew of her private email server arrangement. They certainly were aware that she had a different email address than other State Department employees. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not aware of anybody at the White House uh, who knew um, of the arrangement that she had in place. Is it also then fair to say that no one at the White House makes it a regular occurrence, or the President at least doesn't make it a regular occurrence, to email private email addresses conducting government business? Uh, that's true. The, the instructions that the uh, White House uh, has provided to all federal employees is that they should use their government email for government business. Uh, and if there are uh, isolated situations in which individuals uh, had to use their personal email, that information is, uh, is transferred over to the official system so it can be properly uh, archived uh, and used to respond to specific inquiries. There are a variety of situations where this uh, could come up if you're you know, if your BlackBerry stops working, which uh, has happened on more than one occasion, uh, or if you're traveling overseas and you're having some trouble with connectivity, you may have access to your personal email. Uh, but what's uh, important is that this is a situation that's not the norm, uh, and then in those, in those rare instances uh, when it is used, uh, that those uh, personal emails are uh, properly maintained on the official system by either CCing your official address or just forwarding the exchange uh, over to your uh, official account. Just so I'm clear, so no government business should be transacted between, say, the president's account and some private account that should happen? Well, the, the, certainly when the president's doing business, um, and he does not do very much business over email, uh, as you would expect, the, uh, much of the business that the president's engaged in would uh, reasonably be described as either classified or at least sensitive information. Um, uh, so when the president's doing that kind of business, uh, yes, it is uh, generally over um, government email. Okay, last one. Um, eight of the 11 uh, remaining Obamacare health insurance co-ops, uh, according to reporting, are likely to fail uh, this year. And I'm just curious if knowing now what we know about the dollars spent, about the commitment made, was this the right strategy for the American people? Well, Kevin, the, the focal point of the Affordable Care Act was making sure that we're expanding access to as many people uh, across the country as possible. And when I say access, I mean access to quality, affordable health insurance. And we've seen that uh, some 13 million people now have uh, taken advantage of uh, the Affordable Care Act to get coverage. Uh, and this is good, quality, affordable coverage uh, in the vast majority of cases that they didn't previously have access to. And our goal here was to use competition. Uh, and we have seen positive progress in building competition in individual marketplaces. So uh, in individual states, uh, in 2014, the number of issuers, the average number of issuers per state was eight. Uh, in 20, uh, 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 I'm going to make sure I get the years right, in 2013 it was eight, 2014 it was nine, uh, and this most recent year it was 10. So we've seen a steady increase in the average number of issuers per state 
uh, in these individual marketplaces. The, the premise here is that by increasing competition, we can create an environment in which individual insurers are competing for people's business. That means that individual insurers are going to be competing to drive down costs and to drive up benefits. And that's how we've arrived at a scenario where more people have access to quality, affordable uh, health insurance than ever before. What that, the consequence of that is that when you do see situations where particular health care arrangements don't pan out, the good news for the customers of those arrangements is that they've got lots of other options. They've got lots of other viable options where they can go and get quality, affordable health insurance uh, on, the, uh, on the private market, something that was not previously available to them. So you're okay with $2.5 billion spent, invested in 2010, and eight of the 11 remaining failing. That's, that's okay because the ends justify the means? Is that well, I think what we would like to see in general is increased competition. That's exactly what we've got. Right. We also were looking to save money. Uh, and there, over the next 10 years, we will find, uh, and this is something that even the CBO has concluded, tens of billions of dollars in deficit reduction as a result of the Affordable Care Act. So there is no denying that millions of Americans got access to quality affordable health insurance for the first time because of the Affordable Care Act, and the American taxpayers are going to see health care costs uh, uh, that are paid by the federal government um, limited in such a way that we're actually going to reduce the deficit by tens of billions of dollars. And that's a, that's a significant uh, achievement, uh, one that our naysayers long thought was not possible. Uh, and that's probably why many of those naysayers now won't even acknowledge uh, the important progress that we've been able to make. OK. Thanks, Kristen. Um, thanks, Josh. Um, can you talk a little bit about three, four months into the year, the state of the president's relationship with Speaker Paul Ryan? Do they talk? Do they talk often? When's the last time that they spoke? Does the president think that he's doing a good job? Uh, the president certainly does continue to respect uh, Speaker Ryan. He's, I think no one underestimates the significance of the challenge that he's undertaken. Uh, certainly the president hasn't. Uh, they do speak with some frequency. Uh, oftentimes those conversations those are conversations that we don't disclose. Uh, so I can't uh, tell you the last time that they spoke. Uh, but it certainly is not unusual for uh, the two men to trade phone calls. That's typically how they'll uh, communicate. Um, I don't want to leave you the impression this happens every day or every week even. But uh, it's not unusual for them to, uh, uh, to engage in a conversation. And uh, the President certainly respects the important responsibilities that Speaker Ryan has as the uh, leader of the Republicans in the, uh, in the House of Representatives. And, um, you know, Speaker Ryan is somebody who has uh, demonstrated that he is, uh, takes quite seriously the responsibilities that he has. Uh, he's somebody who's been quite thoughtful about uh, his uh, views and his prescription for how to further strengthen the country. Uh, obviously, the two men have some pretty significant differences of opinion. Uh, and what we've tried to focus on are areas where there is common ground. Passing funding to make sure that our healthcare professionals have the necessary resources to fight Zika is something where Democrats and Republicans should be able to find common ground. Hopefully, Speaker Ryan will uh, take action on that. Um, Speaker Ryan has talked before about how expanding the earned income tax credit could be a powerful way to uh, fight poverty. The President has considered this a uh, reasonable and maybe even promising policy approach. Uh, hopefully, Democrats and Republicans in the Congress could work together to arrive at, a, uh, at an expansion uh, of the Earned Income Tax Credit in a way that would be good for our economy. Uh, Democrats and Republicans along the campaign trail have certainly spent a lot of time talking about uh, how to fight uh, heroin abuse and opioid addiction. Uh, President Obama believes this is a priority. You'll recall he traveled down to uh, Atlanta a couple of weeks ago to talk about this. Uh, uh, hopefully, this is something uh, the, when the President was actually introduced by uh, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, a Republican from Kentucky named Hal Rogers. Uh, hopefully Mr. Rogers and Mr. Ryan can work together uh, to advance uh, this important priority. The President would certainly welcome that. Mr. Ryan, Speaker Ryan made clear that uh, the House would uh, begin to take action to help Puerto Rico address the significant financial challenges that are plaguing Puerto Rico. Uh, the administration has obviously played an important role, and we've seen Democrats and Republicans come together to begin to make some progress. Uh, there's a lot, there's a, long, a lot of work that remains to be done, but they're obviously off to a good start, and we're pleased about that. So uh, there's no shortage of opportunities for uh, Speaker Ryan and President Obama to work together 
uh, in a way that doesn't require either of them to uh, capitulate on core principles. Uh, but there is an opportunity uh, and a requirement uh, that both of them uh, put the interests of the country uh, ahead of more narrow political considerations. And I think it remains to be seen uh, how serious uh, House Republicans are uh, about um, setting aside the, the grousing that they may find in some corners of their party for cooperating with President Obama so that they can actually find some common ground on something that Democrats and Republicans agree would be good for the country. On politics, does President Obama have a position on the possibility that the Republicans could have a broker convention? He does not. <laughs> All right. So hypothetically, if Paul Ryan were to be part of that broker convention, yeah. He would have no feeling on that either. Well, my rudimentary understanding of the uh, Republican nomination process is that as the Speaker of the House, uh, Speaker Ryan actually is the chair of the convention. Uh, so if, uh, if an open convention or a brokered convention does come about, it does seem that uh, Speaker Ryan would, would, whether he likes it or not, uh, play a prominent role in that prospect. And finally, does the White House believe its strategy to confirm Merrick Garland is working? Uh, we certainly have made a lot of important progress uh, in uh, confirming uh, or getting the Senate, frankly, to do its job uh, and to give uh, Chief Judge Garland a fair hearing and a timely yes or no vote. Uh, this is a good opportunity for me to talk about what I think will be a pretty important week uh, in this nomination process. Um, I'm not aware of any meetings that Chief Judge Garland has today on Capitol Hill, uh, but over the course of this week he'll be meeting with 14 different senators. Uh, six of them Republicans. Uh, and he'll be starting tomorrow uh, by having breakfast with the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley. Now, you'll recall uh, that just hours after the announcement of Justice Scalia's untimely death, that leader, Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, announced that the Senate would not be considering uh, a presidential nomination to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. So the fact that, uh, that Judge Garland is meeting this week with six different Republican senators to discuss his nomination, I think is an indication that we've made important progress. And let me explain to you why. After meeting with these Republican senators, I think, I guess by the end of the week, it, it'll, he'll be up to nine because he's already met with three different Republican senators, Senators Collins, Kirk, and Bozeman. But after having those meetings, I think it, an obvious question will be begged of those Republican senators. And it's simply this. If you've had an opportunity to hear from Chief Judge Garland directly, why shouldn't your constituents? After all, you're the one making the case that the people's voice should be heard in this process. So why shouldn't the people have the opportunity to hear from Chief Judge Garland about his views, about his record? He obviously has spent 19 years on the federal bench uh, serving in the, what's often described as the second highest court in the land, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. He has more federal judicial experience than any other Supreme Court nominee in history. So he certainly has the capacity to answer these questions. He's prepared to do it on camera, under oath. He's prepared to take whatever questions Democrats and Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee may have to put forward. He can handle it. I guess the question is, why can't the people asking the questions handle it? I suspect, I have a theory, to the extent that I'm able to divine much insight into the Republican, into the mind of any Republican senator, I think this is what Republicans are concerned about. They're concerned about giving him, him that opportunity because if they do, it will be clear to the American public that he's deserving of a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. And it's going to make it a lot harder for them to justify blocking it. So that's why you've seen Leader McConnell try to shut this down at the pass. But the fact that at the end of the week, Chief Judge Garland will have met with nine Republican senators is an indication that we're making some important progress. There's a long way to go, but uh, it, it certainly is going to, as Chief Judge Garland does these meetings, it's not going to reduce the number of questions that Republican senators are facing about why they're blocking his nomination and refusing to do their job. It's only going to increase the frequency of those questions. And that's significant because we know, for example, that uh, this is an accusation 
that Chairman Grassley himself is pretty uncomfortable with. He himself has said that he resents the notion that he's not doing his job. But the fact is, as the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, he has as much fluence as anyone over whether or not Chief Judge Garland is going to get uh, a fair hearing. Uh, he'll have as much say as anyone uh, about the way uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee reports out his nomination. And that will have a significant impact on uh, how individual members of the United States Senate uh, vote on his nomination. So look, these, uh, these tough questions of the senators uh, are just getting started. And you know, it's ironic that in the back halls of, uh, of Congress, you see a lot of Republican senators sort of ducking questions from members of the media about why they're blocking Chief Judge Garland's nomination, while at the same time you see Chief Judge Garland eager to go out in public, under oath, on camera, and answer all the questions that these senators can think of to ask. I, that is why the position that Republicans have adopted is so difficult to defend, both as a, uh, a matter that's central to their constitutional responsibilities, but it's also why, frankly, as a matter of politics, it's a tough question for them to answer. Okay. Uh, Angela? Thanks, Josh. Uh, on back to the topic of the meeting with the Fed chairwoman, uh, the LA Times reported last year that there's a Federal Reserve regulatory job, the vice chair for supervision, that was created back in Dodd-Frank, but that has never been filled. And now Chairman Shelby is holding up other Fed nominations, uh, saying that this is the, the fact that this job hasn't been filled is the reason for those holes. Uh, does the President have any intention to ever nominate somebody to be the Fed's vice chair for supervision? Well, listen, I, I think it is um – I don't have any uh, personnel announcements to make at this point in terms of individuals who may be considered or when a nomination could be put forward. But I think it is a tough case to make uh, for Senator Shelby to say that he's not going to fill any vacancies on the Fed until one specific vacancy has been filled. Uh, I don't think it sort of matches people's common sense about how the Senate should fulfill its duties, particularly when you consider that there are two individuals, highly qualified Federal Reserve nominees, that have been put forward um, almost a year ago in one case and more than a year ago in the other case to fill important positions on the, uh, on the board. And you know, we're going to continue to make a, a forceful case uh, for these two individuals. and. Chairman Grassley doesn't exactly have a uh, strong record to stand on. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Shelby doesn't have a strong record to stand on uh, when considering uh, nominees to the Senate Banking Committee. Um, it obviously is uh, uh, his failure to act um, expeditiously in this area uh, is something that has already garnered strong criticism uh, of his conduct. and. Uh, his continued obstruction of two highly qualified Federal Reserve nominees is only going to enhance that criticism. Okay. And, um, one other business matter. Does the White House have any comment on Canadian Pacific's decision to abandon its merger attempt with Norfolk Southern Railroad? Uh, I actually am not aware of those reports. I don't know if that's something that just broke, but uh, if there's a specific reaction we have, we can get it to you. Okay. Scott, I'll give you the last one. Thanks, Josh. Has the President had any conversations with Congressman Wasserman Schultz about her payday lending bill? Uh, not that I am aware of. Um, and I don't know the details of the legislation that she has put forward. Obviously, the President has put out a statement announcing his enthusiastic support for her reelection. Uh, but I'm not aware of any position the administration has taken on her legislative proposal. Her uh, legislative proposal would sort of undermine the CFPB's rule that the President was touting a year ago. Uh, well, why don't we uh, when I do a little work on learning more about her legislation, we'll get back to you on it. Okay? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.